Uh, I was born on July 21st, 1926, in my grandmother's house, 63 Lee Avenue, down in the Beach District of Toronto. When I grew up, it was a hard working class district. You know, I always thought I was Jewish because when I was a kid, when I was five, six years old, they called me Jew boy and Jewy, you know. And because um, I grew up in a very anti Semitic uh, neighborhood, East End of Toronto was tough. So I, I played this dual role for a while, I remember. Until I was caught, you know, and then somebody said, what kind of a Jew are you, you know? Uh, you never come to Thames Road. And then it turned out that I, I went to Q Beach United Church <laughs> and went to Sunday school in the afternoons on Sunday because I was, you know, my parents were Methodists. Well, we have a joke about it that he's going to convert him to Judaism and call him and change his name to Norman Christians. <laughs> I used to go to the movies when I was young, and they were, it cost 10 cents. I think I used to go to the Allen Theater down the beach, the beach theater. And I used to get two cents from each kid, and then I would go to the movies, and I would come back, and I would tell them the movie. And, uh, and I would only charge them a cent or two cents, you see. Yeah, they could see they could see the movie through my eyes. But I used to do all the sound effects and I used to die and and uh, but I told them the movies and, and you know it I I guess I started telling the stories that way. Uh, every night Norman decided that he knew a new way of killing himself. <laughs> and he, he every night at dinner table he would do this. I found a new way to die. Watch, watch. But I think I was influenced by all kinds of movies when I was a kid. You know, Gunga Din was one of my favorite movies. Laurel Hardy, Max Sennett. I was a big Max Sennett fan. Uh, I loved that kind of slapstick staged humor. Uh, I love visual jokes. Those kind of things I can remember. I don't think any family in those days supported the idea that someone wanted to be an actor or a writer. My dad just wanted me to get a job. My mother loved, uh, loved it when I entertained because she was a kind of a show business mother in that respect. When I was five years old, six years old, I was, I was reciting poetry for audiences all over the East End of Toronto. I was very big with... I, I was very big with Robert's service, you know. He had a wonderful memory, and he could recite poems and remember his stories so well, and he could just rhyme them right off, no problem. He's a good storyteller. Always was. By the time I was in high school, I was doing a lot of shows. So there was always that interest, I guess, or that desire to be the class clown to be the center of attention, to organize a show, to entertain. So by the time I got to university, I was, uh, I think, pretty well committed to being an actor. My father was worried about that because, you know, how are you gonna make a living as an actor? Norman uh, grew up during the Depression days when things were tough. He's always been a hustler. Uh, he hustled Christmas trees at Winneve and Queen when he was going to university. He drove a cab. He walked horses at the, uh, the Woodbine racetrack when he was a kid. He always tried to make a buck. I traveled by train once in my life, uh, I think when I was 19. I worked for the Band Springs Hotel, you know, the great job for, uh, for university students. After I worked at the Band Springs Hotel, and I thought, you know, I'll go to California, be a movie star, be a writer. Wouldn't it be great if I could get, if I could, like, someone give me a break. And of course, you know, they, uh, 
the, the contacts I had were from a movie that they shot in Banff when I was there. And I, this is way back, 40 years ago, 45. Randolph Scott was making a movie called Union Pacific or something. And uh, so I got the names of people and I went to see them at the studios, you know. Half the time I never got through the gates. <laughs> then I went back to Toronto and got a job as a cab driver. And I learned a lot about human behavior. He didn't know what kind of a job he wanted to get. And uh, there, there wasn't anything opening. And so, uh, so somebody suggested to him, why don't you do TV, why don't you do TV, go into the TV business, which will be uh, the big, uh, big thing coming up. And so he went to England, and he uh, he looked up the Bernie Slade, who is a Canadian, and uh, he threw him a, f a bit of work, and uh, he just hung around all the studios and learned what he could. Well, then he got the letter to come home, and the next thing, my dad gets this note: "Send me some money. I've got to come home right away." There's, the CBC is starting up. As television began, we would gather at Ross McLean's house or anybody's house who had a TV set with its little uh, snowy image coming through from Buffalo and we'd see the hit parade and we'd see oh yeah look at that we, we'd all look we'd see hey hey look they're piling bricks and now they're turning the set how do they do that how do they do that and you know you'd look at Norman's next show and you'd see somebody piling bricks and turning it around. I was invited down to, to, to by CBS, you know, when I left uh, Canada in 1958. And I went to the States to do the hit parade. I didn't want to do the hit parade here. Why would I go to New York to do the hit parade? And that's when I told them. And they said, well, what if we told you you could do anything you wanted with the hit parade? I said, okay. I could deal with Porgy and Bess, I could deal with jazz, I could deal with traditional music, I could deal with Gershwin. So we kind of turned the last two years of the hip parade in the States, we kind of turned it into a much more interesting, eclectic musical program. And then I did Andy Williams' show, I did, you know, the Broadway of Lerner and Lowe, I did all kinds of specials, a lot of them devoted to music. When I did Tonight with Belafonte, that was the first black show on American television. We lost 27 stations before the end of the program. They were throwing chains across the transmission lines in Birmingham, Alabama. You know, that was 1959. What a lot of people may not know about Norman Jerusalem is that uh, he's a man who's fiercely committed to social justice. I've met very few people who have his kind of passion where it's just in every aspect of his life. Uh, he seeks to have messages that are of significance to the betterment of the human condition. I hitchhiked through the South when I was uh, about 18, just when I was getting out of the Navy, 1946. And I saw apartheid. I saw a segregated country. And uh, it was hard for me to understand that. And I think my fascination with Mississippi, Louisiana, Missouri, all the southern states and the, and the separation of the races in America and the race problem, um, it, a lot of those images I ended up using, I think, in, in the heat of the night or films I made many years later. Soldier Story, yeah. Probably is related to those early years uh, and what you're interested in and what kind of stories you're interested in telling. I believe that life is full of laughter and tears. There isn't a day goes by that I don't laugh hysterically at something and there isn't a day goes by that I don't shed a tear or almost shed a tear for something. So I, that's what life is all about. And it's wonderful. And, uh, you know, and film gives you a chance to express that. <laughs>